It's July 1st. Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is me, Danielle Hallen. Welcome back. Any big plans for the 4th, Danielle? Now, I don't want to brag, but there's actually a local parade. Okay. All right. It probably consists of like 15 people. <laughs> Are you going to take a bunch of your animals out there? And go, you know go what? trotting down the street? Honestly, I considered it. Why it's not? like a, it was like a childhood dream of mine to, you know, yeah. ride one of my horses through a parade and I'm in the perfect place to do it. But I don't think so. There's I don't know, usually I'm at the beach for the 4th of July or something, but this year I think I'm just going to hang out here. Okay. okay. Go to the parade, not- enjoy that, hopefully get some candy. They usually throw lots of candy and then hang out at the pool or something. I don't know. Well, if we can't get to the beach, yeah, uh, I guess the pool is a good trade-off. But Danielle, I'm I'm issuing an order right now. This is coming directly okay. from Crime After Crime Central. Okay. Danielle has to get to the beach <laughs> within the next two months because you keep talking about it. It's clear <laughs> that you're missing something in your life, and we need you to have that. So get to the beach. I know. Danielle. Who knows what next year will look like if I don't? And I'm being very serious. <laughs> okay. okay. I need that. It's like soul replenishing for me. Absolutely. Speaking of soul replenishing, it's time for results from the last episode. Absurd arsons. I can't say absurd anymore. I don't know why I keep saying absurd. Absurd arsons. Absurd. Danielle told the story of the abduction. Abduction? Um, I don't think it was an abduction. (laughs) No. We can pretend. We'll okay. Just go along with it. (laughs) Now, it was actually the story of the pillow pyro who set numerous fires and it turned out that he was working a day job mm-hmm. as a fire inspector. Yep. I told Odd the story. How that goes. I know. I know. And I, 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 of course, I wasn't surprised that our stories had such similar mm-hmm. trends. I told the story of Mr. Flair, the Friday firebug, who was trying to burn down Boston in an effort to point out that they needed more firefighters. And Mr. Flair actually turned out to be an entire arson crew. Composed of, <sighs> comprised of law enforcement officers and firefighters. How did it play out, Danielle? All right. On the website poll, mm-hmm. I received 57% of the votes and John received 43%. <gasps> Gasp. <laughs> and Shock. Then on, oh. <laughs> on Twitter, I received 60% of the votes and John received 40%. John, you well, know what this means. It does. First of all, please accept my congratulations, Danielle. Um, we were talking before recording and this season, it's it's been a knockout fight yep. is what it's been. Big hits back and mm-hmm. forth. Uh, I am very proud to hand over the crime after crime mug. There you go, Danielle. You take it for now. I've missed it. I'm Don't serious. Every I feel like well, I feel like every other season, it's been like almost back and forth perfectly. Mm-hmm. Well, last we had a run last season where you yeah. just went on a mad tear, mm-hmm. and then I got scrappy and was holding on. So we had like two periods where it was it was kind of sitting in the same yeah. spot. But uh, recently, yeah, it's it's been like ping pong, man. That thing's just mm-hmm. bouncing back and forth. Mm-hmm. Let's I'll see what it. happens. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens today. I know uh, I brought a good story. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to intimidate <laughs> you or say that I've sent uh, Minnesota flies into your room to I disrupt know, you when grief. you're trying to read. But uh, today we are looking into Canadian crimes. And if you're looking to play a drinking game while listening, hey, this is on the weekend of the fourth. Yeah, you might be <clears throat> mm-hmm. you might be sitting out somewhere. Maybe you have a drink in hand. Take a shot every time one of us says a. Which I will say probably won't be me. I do it super awkwardly, <laughs> but I can almost assure every single one of you that John will repeatedly say. It. <laughs> I'll do my best to work in as many as possible because I want you to enjoy your Fourth of July, a. Eh? <laughs> exactly. See, our neighbors to the north are known for a handful of things, mainly loving hockey, great maple syrup, and a friendly disposition. That's right. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I want to start this off. Danielle, do you know how to spell Canada? How they spell it in Canada? Wouldn't they just spell it like, like regular what? Canada? Like C-A- C-A- I feel a trick a- coming on and I like don't want to say it. Ready? <laughs> okay. C-A- 
N A A D A. Someone just took like six shots. I know. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> also known for putting ketchup on their craft macaroni and cheese. Okay. Put, putting ketchup on their grilled cheese sandwiches and having a side of ketchup flavored potato chips with all that. Canada actually consumes more ketchup per capita than the United States, but not as much as Finland. Okay, but ketchup on grilled cheese is actually delicious. You know, I can't argue because I have tried the ketchup flavored potato chips last time I was in Canada. Is it good? I've never had those. They are super good. Mm -hmm. They are ridiculously Mm -hmm. good. Like I think I ate a whole bag. It was over the course of a weekend, but I think I knocked (laughs) the whole bag out myself. It was so (laughs) good. Um, honestly, the thing I'm not sure about is macaroni and cheese, like putting yeah, ketchup on your macaroni and cheese. I'm not sure. Notice that I've like fully ignored that. <laughs> I fully <laughs> I ignored like, it. I like tomato. Like I'll have tomato, like cut up yeah. tomato in. I, I don't necessarily have it with my craft macaroni and cheese, but if I go to like noodles and company or something, Yum. you know, yeah. yeah, I can, I can have tomato in there, but mm-hmm. I don't know about ketchup. They've also got something really interesting where they can't use corn syrup in their ketchup. Like they've got a law that stops corn syrup okay. being used in their ketchup so maybe it's more that probably maybe, it's has a something vegetable. to do with it yeah. yeah it's a canadian vegetable yep now canada's also known for molson beer whose slogan is get this you ready yeah i am a canadian that's it very direct and to the point yeah just that <laughs> I am a Canadian. <laughs> I'm a Canadian. I like it. I could see a shirt. I am a Canadian, yeah. but I, I, I couldn't wear it. Um, <laughs> they also have some interesting laws. According to <laughs> Winnipeg criminal defense lawyer dot CA. That was another cue there. I'm Canada, so sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Canada has its share of bizarre laws, such as it it's illegal to water ski at night. You can face up to six months of jail and a $5,000 fine. So don't do it. It's also illegal to scare a child or a sick person to death in Canada. Danielle, I had to I had to look this up because I'm like, is that even a real thing? Like, could you literally scare someone to death? I know we've seen in movies, like when you scare someone, like maybe their hair will turn gray or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, according to the Cleveland Clinic, quote, whether you have heart disease or not, the likelihood of sudden death from a scare is incredibly rare so it actually is possible oh boy i was surprised a little bit yeah so watch out children and sick people (laughs) (laughs) that also goes hand in hand with this next law until recently it was illegal to scare the queen in canada no one's ever been charged with this and they repealed it in 2018. i I didn't even know canada had a queen who's the queen of canada celine dion yep I'll name her personally. Celine Dion is the queen of Canada. <laughs> this is another one I looked into. Uh, they mean the actual, the queen, as in the, the queen of England. Uh, so, yeah. What an interesting law to Don't have. Don't scare her. I know. I know. <laughs> well, I mean, Danielle, she's getting up there in age. She's She's been around you a minute. Might, so, she, yeah. yeah. She Don't could be scared. scared. To death. I, honestly, at this point, if anyone, <laughs> if there was a potential to scare anyone to death, it might be the queen. Uh, finally, here is a law that I can get behind. It's illegal to make purchases using too many coins. The Canada's Currency Act sets a limit on the number of coins of any type that you can use in a single transaction. You can use no more than 25 pennies, 100 nickels, 100 dimes, 40 quarters, 25 loonies, or 20 toonies. Yes, Danielle, they really have money that they call loonies and toonies. Oh my gosh. <laughs> If you try to use more coins than the limits above, the vendor can refuse to accept them. Now, that just makes sense, Danielle. Did you hear what oh I said? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> just going to let it hang out there, wait just, for someone. Someone in the back. Enjoy, everyone just a, enjoy. <laughs> a little chuckle from someone in the back, please. Please. <laughs> We're just going to let it sit until it happens. All right. It's time to kick off this show. Let's start the Canadian crimes with a case mm. told by the A. Amazing, Danielle Hallen. A. Man, you fit it in there so perfectly. This is why I can't say A because I would like accidentally put it in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> I, it just like doesn't come naturally. That's <laughs> I just okay. can't I'll, do it. I'll handle it for now. But you're, by the end, I want to hear one. I want to hear you oh, get one no. in there. Oh no, okay. Yeah, just that one. makes me nervous. All right. <laughs> okay, so 
I don't know if you guys remember or not, but in my last journey to Canada on this podcast, like I didn't physically go to Canada, I spoke about the cheese industry and a group of cheese smugglers that refused to let pizza restaurants sink to mozzarella prices. Mm-hmm. Whole shebang. Now, little did I know that the battle of cheese in Canada actually goes head to head with a much sweeter battle that's worth up to 25 times more than a barrel of oil. Well, really? Yes. I hesitate saying that because I know oil is a little sensitive subject (laughs) right now. (laughs) But yeah, it's real. And the sweet prize is maple syrup. Mm. Now, making maple syrup is a very serious science. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. It takes an incredible amount of patience that I do not and will not ever have. Maple trees can only be tapped from February to April. And the conditions have to be just right. While it's very easy for you or my son, maybe is the only one, to pour about a gallon of maple syrup on his pancakes in the morning, the effort that goes into making that gallon of syrup is extensive. If a tree is tapped too early, if the weather's too warm, the entire operation for an entire year can be ruined. But if everything goes smooth, it still takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. (laughs) What? It's like you keep waiting for this like relief and it just never comes. It's weird. Like I just had this picture in my head that they put like literally like put a spigot in a tree and you open the spigot. Yeah. Yeah, and then I just thought the like syrup poured out, but the sap pours out, and then it has to be refined to the syrup. So you basically boil it down, and it takes, okay. from my understanding, like days, if not longer, yeah, to boil okay. down. And like to put that into perspective, a typical smaller bathtub is forty gallons. Mm-hmm. So it takes a bathtub of sap to create a gallon. Wow. That's wow. nuts. And you can only get like five at the minimum to 15 gallons of sap per tree. So you're like gallon of syrup that you get to two trees, <laughs> technically yeah. like two and a half to make. Now, because sap conditions can be so finicky, maple syrup also can't just be produced willy nilly anywhere. And in fact, over 70% of the entire world's maple syrup production comes directly from Quebec. And here, I just want to let everyone know this caused an entire argument in my household about how to properly pronounce that. <laughs> it's a th- I'm so serious. I'm yeah. so serious because my dad goes there all the time and he says it's Quebec. Quebec, yeah. Yeah. I always called it Quebec, like Quebec, pronouncing yeah. the U. Yeah. I mean, I think people will understand either way if, if you go, but yeah, it's, it's it Quebec. It goes either way. It's, you, say, you say Quebec? <laughs> oh, good grief. Um, I do, I do put a little inflection, but only because, like, you know, my best friend's Canadian. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I go up there every now and then. That's and why I you're have so good fun. at saying A. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I have fun with with those inflections and stuff because I, I say them. Like, one of one of my best buddies on Call of Duty is Canadian, and a bunch of the stuff that I learned for this episode, I was kind of dropping on him like yesterday. He doesn't oh know that gosh. I do this. Like, he doesn't yeah. know that I do podcasts or anything. But all of a sudden, yeah, I was you're I was hitting him with some of these right. <laughs> Canadianisms. They're just they're fun. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, Qu- Quebec. Quebec. of the world's maple syrup supply, okay? It's a very serious operation, so serious that it's controlled by the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers. Literally a federation of maple syrup, okay? The FPAQ is a government-sanctioned organization that essentially regulates the entire maple syrup market. They're in charge Oh, you mean the FPAC? FPAC? Are you familiar with that? No. I was about to be like, what am it I missing sounds... here? Dang. <laughs> just sounds like it. Sounds like it the should F-pac. be. Oh, ah. the F-pack, eh? <laughs> it's, I'm telling you. And they're in charge of absolutely everything from the quotas to the maple syrup reserve, which is a real thing. Basically, they act as a main hub to all the producers. The producers send their fixed amount of maple syrup and basically from f I like calling that now. Yeah. Yeah. It can just be distributed from there. Now, they're actually viewed by many as being a cartel. (laughs) I mean, they're kind of like... They kind of are. (laughs) Yeah, you're holding on to a reserve. It's almost like the diamond industry is what it sounds like. It's it's John, yes, okay? 
Now, despite what producers are capable of making, and this is why a lot of people view it as a cartel, they're only allowed to give so much to the Federation. So you have your set amount that you can give to them mm -hmm. and you cannot sell it on your own. You cannot just right. go in and take your product and sell it. It has to be sold through the Federation and you only get paid when the syrup sells. Mm hmm. Yeah, which it could does. be it sounds years. Like price, it sounds like price fixing. It sounds like a mechanism for yeah. setting it up. I mean, the if price. they, yeah, yeah, if they decide to put all of the syrup that you gave them this year into the reserve, right, they right. could decide to not sell that syrup for like years, and yeah. then you get paid. Yeah, yeah. So if maple syrup heist isn't funny enough, take maple syrup cartel and just run with it, because really, you can. <laughs> I'm telling you now, these reserves very highly important to the FPAQ, and they were originally established in 2000. Multiple warehouses exist across Quebec, housing millions of pounds of maple syrup. And the Federation maintains these for a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, as I stated, it's very difficult to even get maple syrup. You're heavily relying on the weather and the fluctuations. And so if something goes wrong, a whole year of supply can be gone. But if that happens, there's this backup supply that they have. They can continue to provide to consumers regardless of that thing. year's succession. Yeah. So yeah, you're that's like, a good right. thing about a yeah. reserve. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, I mean, outside of the price fixing aspect, it is good to know that they could do that because then, yeah. you know, I mean, there's companies that could go under if if they had a bad batch. Oh, yeah. Essentially with that mechanism, they're saved. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's cool. Helps them control the market. As we said, they're able to stabilize the prices. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> stabilize, stabilize the prices. There's essentially never this loss of stock, constant supply. And they also use it if there's like a large surplus in the market, no one's buying it. They can offer great incentives to drive up the market. They really are in like a no losing kind of situation. And hopefully all that information gives you a little bit of insight as to why this hot item is priced the way it is, first of all, because mm -hmm. it's freaking expensive. <laughs> Yeah, when and, you were saying like buying a gallon, yeah. like, uh, who would ever buy a gallon? Like unless you were working at a restaurant or something. Me. Like the, the bottles I buy are like this big. I buy a gallon. <laughs> I kid you not. And I'm not even joking, but that's also because I have like a, uh, an addiction to it. <laughs> I, I'm serious. I put, well, that's what I use as my sweetener in most things instead of yeah, like same here. Yeah. refined sugar. So like I'll Literally use that in to my sweeten. tea right now. Yeah. See, and my tea and my smoothies um, and my oatmeal, like all of that. So mm -hmm. I go through some maple syrup. Yeah. How did the cat get in here? <laughs> so, yeah, just to let everyone know, you might hear um, yeah. some <laughs> some little meows in the background. I've Danielle got a lot of cats. <laughs> has opened her heart and yeah. opened her home to foster some kitties. So yes. that's, that's what you're hearing in the background there. Now... Very expensive, but also that information hopefully will show you how it became the perfect item for an infamous Canadian heist. Mm. So back in 2011, there was a bumper year for maple syrup. And for those of you who are not familiar with that term, basically Canada produced an absurdly large amount of maple syrup that year. So it was a good one, but usually it unexpectedly happens. And because of this, they had to rent out a warehouse temporarily where they ultimately stored 16 thousand drums of maple syrup each drum holding 54 gallons of maple syrup and we know this is pricier than gasoline exactly okay. and this warehouse was known as the and i'm totally going to butcher this and i apologize <laughs> you can't look at me so expectantly john i'm gonna help you the si oh no are you really okay no, no so no, if i think I mean, it's the saint louis de blanc de blanford de blanford <laughs> Um, you know, Strategic they have a lot of, reserve. they have a lot of French inflection up there. So just throw yes. a little French on it and yeah, that, that'll be it. Well, that's Saint, what it was known as. Saint Louis Blancfort. <laughs> that almost sounded <laughs> Russian. <laughs> I lost it at the end. It just, it took a left on me. <laughs> it's very, and you guys, I spent very long time on Google trying to find the proper way to pronounce a lot of this, but <laughs> things didn't go so well. Now, okay. the very particular issue with this warehouse is that it was not up to par in terms of security. So there were no cameras in this warehouse. There mm. were no alarms. Mm. And this was repeatedly brought up to the FPAQ being like, hello, <laughs> like this is expensive. This is important. But they shrugged it off saying no one's going to come and steal a 54 gallon drum of maple syrup, let alone 16,000 of them. 
they really underestimate how much people love maple syrup. <laughs> I was going to say, Danielle might. <laughs> I might. I'm so serious. I love maple syrup. <laughs> so pair the lack of security with the fact that the facilities were only inspected once a year and you honestly have the perfect setup here. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, another name I'm going to butcher. Avik Karen's wife was okay. the owner of the warehouse that was being used to store this maple syrup, okay? And right away, he sees an opportunity. So as I said, many view the Federation as a cartel that's totally monopolized the industry. They're the ones that set the quotas and the prices and essentially the producers are at their mercy. You know, a lot of people just don't think it's great. So he started to figure out a plan to remove the maple syrup without being detected. And because the market is so guarded, he wanted to look for black market buyers that would pay high prices to smuggle the syrup. This was a great way to make a lot of money while also getting back at the Federation. Okay. Risky, risky, I know. Yeah, yeah. Now comes in a man named Richard Valieres. <laughs> I'm probably so pronouncing that Is he from well. Spain? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's how they pronounced it when I looked it up. I don't okay. know. Okay. Richard was a well-known barrel roller. And a barrel roller is basically someone that bypasses the Federation mm -hmm. by rolling barrels onto their own truck and selling it themselves. They buy directly from the producers. They sell things on their own. Cutting out the middleman means a lot more money for the producers who they're the ones putting a lot of hard work and effort into it. And he had been a barrel roller for at least 10 years flying under the radar. Richard also had a father named Raymond that had a sugar shack or a sap house, which is basically just a cabin where sap is boiled down into the maple syrup. And this provided a great place to store all of the stolen syrup while using Richard's connections to then sell it because he knew lots of people. And this ended up being a man named Etienne St. Pierre, Nice. Got it. Yes, you did. <laughs> he was a New Brunswick syrup buyer. And from my understanding, he did buy from the Federation, but he also was very against them and the money that they took from people and the control that they had. So he would also participate in the black market for maple syrup in Canada. But how are they going to do this without raising any suspicion? You can't just casually walk in <laughs> and get a... 54 pound barrel or gallon barrel and pick it up right so because karen's wife was part owner of the warehouse he along with the others decided to rent out a small space in the cluster of warehouses where the syrup was kept this would allow them to come and go as they please and also use machinery to move things around like the barrels and they really wouldn't raise any red flags they hired on a man named sebastian jutras who would be a truck driver to help transport the syrup and i believe that sebastian was good friends with richard and the heist at this point was in full swing. Over the course of almost a year, from 2011 to 2012, the thieves slowly began to take a few barrels at a time from the reserve. So essentially, they would make their way in there. I have no clue how they even got into that specific warehouse itself. It's not yeah. ever really been made clear. But they would take a few barrels at a time, load it up into their semi-truck, and then Sebastian would then drive to the sugar shack. Now, once they were at the sugar shack, Richard and Raymond were prepared with multiple empty barrels of their own, which, by the way, were not food grade. Ooh, come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, I know. And they would then siphon the syrup from the Federation barrels into their own. Now, since the barrels were counted during the inspection and also typically weighed 600 pounds each, they knew that they had to refill the barrels or they immediately would be caught. So they refilled the barrels with lake water mm -hmm. and then returned them back so that the yearly inspection count wasn't going to be off. No one would suspect a thing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So now once they have their syrup and their own barrels, it was then taken out of Quebec as fast as possible to get it out of the FPAQ's watchful eye. They didn't want them breathing down their necks. And from there, they were going to resell. 
They would take the large portions of the maple syrup, break them down into smaller batches and distribute them all throughout New Brunswick. I think they even took some of it into Vermont, which is tricky because Vermont's like the next top place where it's produced. Mm -hmm. um, but the syrup actually wasn't even mainly being sold in the black market like originally planned. They were selling to legitimate buyers that believed they were buying from the Federation. Oh, because if you could do that, then you can get full retail. Exactly. Yeah. So they're just totally contaminating the market. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> just you're like, also going to be noticed. Like all of a sudden when when the real guys come around and they're like doing, oh, you want your annual restock? And those companies are going, no. I already got it. <laughs> That's not even what took them down. Though. Okay. Now, when the weather cooled off, obviously the lake they were using to refill the barrels froze. They did temporarily move the operation to a different warehouse in Montreal instead of the Sugar Shack. But eventually they, in my opinion, got a little lazy and decided to simply siphon the barrels directly at the Federation warehouse and not refill them. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. So as you can see, this ultimately led to their demise. Mm -hmm. July of 2012, it's the amazing time of year in Canada where maple syrup is being inspected. <laughs> <laughs> Inspector Michael Gavreau performed the annual inspection for the Federation at this particular warehouse. This meant checking all 16,000 barrels very meticulously. I don't know if they actually count every single one of them, but as Michael began to climb this mountainous tower of barrels, why they climbed them beyond me, I don't know. <laughs> but each of these barrels, since they do a 600 pounds, you should be able to easily climb them no problem. But as he's reaching the top, he stepped on one of the barrels and it flips out from underneath of him, almost causing him to plummet all the way down to the warehouse floor. When he took a closer look, man, that he barrel was, was empty. empty. Yep. So he continued to look around, ended up finding another empty barrel and another empty barrel and another empty barrel. And then he starts tapping on some of the barrels and you could tell that some of them were not full anymore, that some of the syrup had been taken from them. And they keep them in these white food grade barrels, like pristinely white. Mm -hmm. And he noticed that some of them were rusting. Mm. Hmm. He's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Not our maple syrup. Our maple yeah. syrup does not rust. <laughs> yeah. Lake water. And exactly. And that's what he found. He would open yeah. it up and found lake water. Immediately, the authorities initiated an investigation. Okay. How on earth did someone manage to take the syrup? Who knows how much at this point? They hadn't even had a chance to figure out how much and get away with it. First of all, it would be incredibly difficult to remove these barrels empty them and then bring them back. How do you hide that much maple syrup? And then how do you sell it without the Federation figuring it out? Because they keep things in check. Like there have been people that have been thrown in prison for, for taking their syrup. This is no joke. Yeah. So they believed from the get go, this was an inside job. So police were able to focus on those that had access to all of the warehouses. Now in total, over 300 people were interviewed. A total of 40 different search warrants were issued to get to the bottom of the heist. And while that was being done, the Federation was going through the barrels to see what exactly they had lost. They found that 9,571 barrels out of the 16,000 barrels in that reserve had been totally emptied. More than half were empty. <laughs> and keep in mind, they were taking a few at a time. Right, right. So the this is going of, on. Yeah. The amount it's going of work on. to get that many barrels. The syrup missing had a total market value of, you ready? <clears throat> yep. 18 million Canadian dollars. Whoa. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> that is so much maple syrup. <laughs> like, I can't even no, picture eight, that without laughing. <laughs> 18 million dollars in maple syrup. Wow. Uh huh. Wow. And it didn't take long at all for authorities to be able to pin it on Karen and his group of bandits, like almost immediately. 
between the 18th and 20th of December, a total of 17 men were arrested in connection with the heist, with those original five being charged as the main perpetrators. Richard, the barrel roller, was accused of being the ringleader, which I don't quite understand. I think they just had it out for him because he had been participating in stuff like this for a very long time. From yeah. my understanding, Karen had not really done anything like this before. And despite pleading not guilty to trafficking, fraud, and theft, he was found guilty anyway in 2016. Now, he claimed he sold the syrup for $10 million and then profited $1 million. He had originally been sentenced to eight years in prison and was fined $9 million. They gave him a time frame, like if he didn't pay the money back in a certain amount of time, they would extend his sentence. Yeah. But he he fought back against this. In 2020, he went to the appeals court where they reduced his fine to only $1 million Because he basically was like, yeah, but I only profited $1 million. <laughs> But it's they did it at first. They were yeah. like, we did it. Yeah. Didn't last though. 2022, okay. they decided to go back and uphold the original fine. They were like, since when and in what right. world do we <laughs> do do we say, hey, well, we know that like you took this much in goods, but since you only profited this much. Yeah. They're like, we yeah. can't let thieves determine, you know. What type of argument is that? It's like, well, yeah. I did all this work and yeah, exactly. I only made this much, so I should only have to pay that much back. Mm. I'm surprised that that even flew for two years like i don't well, even and the understand other 16 the other 16 people didn't do it for free so what exactly. he wanted he wanted them to charge them individually and then go collect the little pieces that they had been paid one at a time <laughs> oh my it's it's a nightmare and yeah. honestly he didn't even admit to it initially now despite being called the ringleader he claimed that he actually <laughs> at first he was only selling the syrup under duress he said that he had been selling syrup for a decade as a barrel roller. He did admit to that, but he said that he had no clue that this specific syrup that he was taking was directly from the Federation's warehouse. He's like, man, I have my limits and that's it. <laughs> and he said he tried to get out of the deal. He didn't want to do anything against the Federation, but was threatened at gunpoint by Karen, who apparently also threatened his wife and child. He made it this whole big deal. However, texts between Karen and Richard show that that's not at all the case. Yeah. He was definitely in on it. Yeah. Now, Karen pleaded guilty to theft and trafficking and also claimed during his testimony, which is very interesting, that a Federation staff member was actually involved in the scheme. Possible. I would say it's possible. Well, it launched an investigation. Yeah. And led to no arrests. But it was quieted down. It was like very, very hush hush. And from what Karen said, basically what what has been claimed to have happened is that their scheme was actually caught way earlier than this. And someone noticed something was going on and went to their superior and told the superior about it. And the superior was like, I'll pay you if you don't say a word. Mm, mm. And you so know, this, yeah. You you previously mm. said that this operation works like a cartel, mm -hmm. and I would imagine that these are people, especially when you're talking about assets like that. They yep. have friends, like yep. guys not on the up and up, that could handle things and take care of things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I just would not want to go up against that type of organization that was funded Absolutely in that way. Absolutely not. Yeah, and I'm not surprised that there's no big thing that comes out. I think if you were looking for who that connected person might be, you might want to start looking at obituaries for some people that have passed no, away seriously. recently. No, seriously. Yeah, I mean, that's... Man. I mean, I and I and it says specifically that they did launch another investigation, but like I tried to look deeper into it. There is not a single piece of information out there about it. Yeah. I just know that yeah. no arrests were ever made and they just like didn't speak on it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, oh... Oh, that's interesting and nerve wracking. <laughs> now, Karen ended up being sentenced five years in prison, had to pay $1.2 million. Richard's father, Raymond, who was basically just the sugar shack owner and was like this midway point, he was only convicted of possession of the stolen maple syrup because he was that halfway point and was sentenced to two years in prison and then three years of probation afterwards. And then the New Brunswick seller, St. Pierre, was convicted of fraud <laughs> and trafficking. 
and sentenced to two years in prison, also three years in probation, and he was handed a fine of $850,000. The truck driver served eight months in prison. That's about it. He was just driving stuff around. Yeah. Now, yeah. all of the other people that were arrested, I was trying to figure out about them because when you research this, you only hear about these five. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, it might, seen, it might get down to like like that truck driver level. That's where what they, I, yeah. They were being hired and they weren't necessarily aware if it was an illegal operation or not. Yeah. They were just being paid like an hourly mm -hmm. rate or something. So from what I was able to determine, essentially as it got bigger and bigger and bigger, they started to bring more people on to help with like the siphoning and, you know, transporting and things like that. Um, I do know that there was one person one other name I found, his name was Gene Lord, and I laughed at that for a while. <laughs> and <laughs> he was charged with possession. Yeah. But it ended up being dismissed. That's the only other name that I could find. And it did say something along the lines of, those are just the charges as of yet, but I doubt anyone's sitting around waiting for their trial still. Um, well, you know, you said something early on that I kind of clubbed onto and that was th that there was 17 people involved mm -hmm. in this operation in some way and the yep. first thing that popped in my mind is like which one of them's going to talk which one of them and to yeah. know that that didn't necessarily happen for this mm -hmm. to go the way that it did would mean that the information was being contained properly that basically yep. out of that 17 maybe the five that they charged were the only ones that really knew that this was a theft operation and Very the likely. other 12. Yeah, because you would, if you had 17 people- Because again, you people, don't want to mess with the Federation. <laughs> no, and if you had 17 people in, in mm -hmm. on a big secret like that, one of them's going to flip. The yeah, guy being paid the least. Yeah, the guy being paid the least at the bottom, he's going to say, oh, I wonder what those other guys would pay me for telling him about this. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, yeah it's, uh, hmm. Now, at the end of the day, Richard said, quote, stealing from thieves is not stealing. And the feeling that the Federation was taking hard-earned money from producers still remained at the center of what they did. However, it was pointed out that by taking the syrup straight from the Federation, that the group actually cost, I think, over 10,000 producers so much of their hard work and money in the end. I mean, that was a lot of syrup. And because they take very specific portions from so many different people, I think there's like... 16,500 or 18,500 producers in Quebec alone. Yeah. There's so many producers like those you're taking you, the entirety of what a lot of these different individuals have, you know, managed yeah. to make that year. Now, this did cause a closer look into the Federation's grasp on the maple syrup market, along with the treatment of producers, but just, just like the rest of the 17 people and the investigation into the you know, corrupt employee. I got absolutely nowhere with that. <laughs> I don't think anything quiet. ever. Yeah. They like briefly mentioned it at the end of a few articles. There were like a few small quotes on it. Like we're going to look into this. I don't think anything was ever changed. Yeah. Nothing at all yeah. was done. And a huge thank you to Vanity Fair, the Canadian Encyclopedia, National Post and History 101 for the information on that story. I love that this guy thinks he was like the Robin Hood. Like yeah. That's exactly what it is. And <laughs> I'm telling you, maple freaking syrup, man. <laughs> oh, goodness, Danielle. They feel very strongly about it. I guess so. I guess so. Um, it's not wow. stealing. Stealing from thieves is not <laughs> stealing. It is. It's Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know. <sighs> I don't know if I can match. It's interesting because once again, our stories have crazy parallels. Um. I can't get close to you in terms of the amount of money, but another inside job, another theft type situation. That's what we're going to hear on the other side of this commercial break. We'll be right back. We know Canadians love their ketchup and what goes better with ketchup than HelloFresh. It's summer. Time to bust out the grill and make dinner from HelloFresh's cookout collection with recipes like Melty Monterey Jack Burgers, which are my all-time favorite. Those would go perfect on the Chesterfield with a 2 4 Molson, eh, Keener? Are you speaking English, John? <laughs> Just put on your toque and give her, Danielle. Anyways, HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant and is even cheaper than grocery shopping. 
and the food tastes great. My favorite this week was a zucchini, mozzarella, and sun-dried tomato panini with a side of potato wedges. It was so easy and quick to cook, and it came out absolutely perfect. Another hit from Lord and Ramsay. Foolproof step-by-step recipes mean a joyful cooking experience, okay? Joyful and a stress-free summer. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Don't get in a kerfluffle, you hoser. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Also available in Canada at HelloFresh.ca. <laughs> Try North America's number one meal kit right now. All right, you guys, welcome back. If you're as confused about the jibber jabber that just came out of John's <laughs> mouth, raise your hand. Don't get in a kerfluffle, <laughs> you hoser. Sit on the Chesterfield with your two poor emulsions. Like that makes me just my brain like can't. It's like, uh, <laughs> what? Oh my gosh. All right. Well, here we go. Um, Danielle, you talked about an inside job. Yes. This case in particular has been referred to by publications as the ultimate inside job. Ooh, I'm intrigued. See, I, if, I already know this is going to be great. You're over here. I don't know if I can top that no, one, Danielle. I don't. No, you're you're about to destroy me. I feel it. Eighteen million dollars in maple. That I mean, you've 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 given me a huge uphill to climb here. But let's see if we can do this. I need a little help from a man named Leston Lawrence. In 2008, Leston Lawrence got a great job at the Royal Canadian Mint. Established exactly 100 years prior, the headquarters has been in the same historic building in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada the entire time. Initially, this location produced Canada's circulation coins, but after another location was built and that service was moved to it, the Ottawa Royal Canadian Mint now focuses on precious metal storage, and processing and producing world-renowned collector coins, world-renowned gold and silver bullion, and medals and medallions that honor those who have made a significant impact in Canada. Its total assets of as of 2016 were over $400 million. Wow. That's a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little more Good. than 18, but... Yeah, mm. a, little, a, little, a little bit more mm. than 18 million in maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> so... Leston became one of 1,280 employees, and at the time, the Mint was named one of Canada's top 100 employers. He did several tasks at the Mint, including melting down raw batches of gold oh, and wow. removing impurities from it. So after the impurities were removed, like I guess they would pour like different chemicals yeah. on it and like cook this stuff up, and then mm -hmm. the impurities kind of rise to the top, and they like you know scrape them off. Um, but at some point after the impurities are removed, Leston would take a custom made ladle and like dip it in and do a test pull. So basically he would scoop out some of the liquid gold and then test it to see how pure it was. Now the mint makes some of the finest gold available as high as 99.9% .9 pure, which is basically 24 karat gold. Yeah. The test pulls are called pucks because... We're in Canada and they can't stop thinking about hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's because they're shaped like a puck. Or and, sort of, and probably also hockey. Well, and yeah, they, they really can't stop thinking about hockey. <laughs> um, it's shaped like a puck or sort of like an Oreo cookie for people that aren't into hockey and don't know what a hockey puck looks like. <laughs> they're about the diameter of a golf ball. And uh, after they run the purity test, they're supposed to put those pucks back into the vat. Uh -oh. Suppo supposed to. <laughs> I feel like I know where this is going. Hmm. The Royal Canadian Mint obviously takes security seriously. The building is built like an absolute fortress. They employ full-time and casual security officers who are responsible for the security and inspection of RCM facilities. They wear a distinctive black uniform with body armor. They carry a 9mm Glock Model 17 while on duty. The security staff operates x-ray machines, inspects garbage in the high security production area. Oh, wow. Smart, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah, check that garbage on the way out. 
um, monitors all shipments to and from the facilities. And that's on top of all the other usual security jobs like monitoring CCTV, escorting visitors, controlling access to different departments, the parking lots and all that stuff. Another thing they do is operate metal detectors. And that's where this story gets interesting. Leston had been working at the Mint for several years now, and he was making a little over $50,000 a year annually. For some reason, in late 2014, Leston kept setting off the archway metal detectors. Mm. Between December 15th, 2014 and March 2nd, 2015, he set it off 28 times. Holy moly. And... That was more times than employees that had actual metal implants would set it off. <laughs> Something tells me that's a red flag. But he's setting them off. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so security, hey, something's up with this guy. Yeah, hello. <laughs> and he's setting them off like more often than once every two days. Like, you know, it's like three, four times a week he's setting them off. He'd have to get a second scan. And that's where they would pull out that handheld wand detector like you've seen at the airport. Yeah. You know, and go over his body. Um, the readings from the archway scanner were comparable to as if he was carrying a large metal object like a knife, but oh, wow. the wand scan would never find anything on him. That's There's even weird. a video. There's even a video of him going through this process mm -hmm. and you can see he's <clears throat> acting like he's annoyed. Like he kind of comes walking into it and he's like, oh. you know, it went off again. And even the security guy that comes around to do the wanding like yeah. he acts like he's annoyed too he's like oh another one of these and he's kind of just like waving it around him and nothing happens oh my gosh and they might have been annoyed because apparently the arch scanners were known to go off frequently for multiple employees oh but, okay but, but less still. than yeah his numbers were just off the charts he was yeah. he was becoming a regular so he carries on working but on february 5th 2015 a bank teller became suspicious Leston was trying to deposit two checks worth over $15,000 in total. And he wanted to wire most of those funds to Jamaica. Oh, that's normal. <laughs> hey, hi. I know I don't normally have this much money, but can you uh, yeah. take these and wire it to a different country for me? Yeah. Wire this to Jamaica for me. The teller is kind of sensing, hey, something's a little off here. Kind of asked about Finally. it. Finally. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Leston said he had just sold some gold nuggets and he wanted to transfer money to his parents to help them rebuild their home in Jamaica. Okay. The teller, yeah. It's, it's, I'd be like, uh, all right, that's sweet. Okay, yeah. But the teller also noticed that Leston was an employee at the Mint and Ooh. the check was actually from a store that bought gold in the same mall that the bank was in. <laughs> she thought, it's probably worth reporting to my management. So she mm -hmm. did. And pretty soon, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were on the case. They got a search warrant for a safety deposit box that Leston had. And oh, my gosh. in there, they found four gold pucks. Now, each puck weighed uh, 220 grams or about half a pound and had a retail value of somewhere around 13000 Canadian dollars. Oh, my they, gosh. They also found paperwork in the deposit box that detailed the sale of either 17 or 18 other gold pucks. The RSMP then conducted another search at his home and they found records stating that he had wired thousands of dollars to both Jamaica and the United States. So he had already done that multiple times before, before at the bank, before other red flags. Yeah. Or finally someone's like, oh, hey, we should probably do something about this. This seems off. It, I think it just took this teller. Like he just hit the wrong yeah, teller. He hit exactly. a teller that's just like, hey, what's, oh, what's. Yeah, sure. Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little more about this because they probably recognize that the checks were from the gold shop in the same. Yeah. Mall. Yeah. But then putting together, oh, wait, he's an employee at the Mint. He's selling yeah. raw gold at the gold store and then coming in here and sending the money out of the country. Takes an investigative mind. Yeah. I think it was the right person. Yeah. Now, interestingly, the Mint never investigated Leston. They never identified that any gold was missing. But think about this, Danielle. Basically, it was in the refinement process when it was being stolen. So a yeah. change of amount or weight. Exactly. That's kind of expected. Yeah, exactly. you're just like, oh, that's the extra crap that I just slid off the top oh, and man. dropped off on the ground. I yeah. hadn't even really thought about that. Yeah, so they had no, they had no idea. 
It was almost a perfect crime, but mm -hmm. that cautious bank teller brought it all down. Leston was charged with theft, money laundering, possession of stolen property, and breach of trust. Do we have that charge here? I've never heard that charge before. Breach of I've trust. I've never heard. I've never heard that here either. Yeah, I want to lay that on some people. <laughs> breach of trust. Is my ex-wife listening Take to this? That <laughs> breach of trust. <laughs> John's going to make it happen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Leston, <laughs> he was now facing some serious prison time. As investigators learned more, they found out that the security at the Mint, not as great as everyone thought. Mm. First of all, there was only one security camera in the large refinery where Leston worked, and staff frequently worked in there alone. There were many of spots out of view of the camera with a slight bit of planning, like just a very, very slight yeah, bit of planning. Yeah, bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the camera was basically useless. He had plenty of opportunity to pocket the gold in that room. But how did he get the gold out of the mint? Every employee is scanned on the way out. Well, investigators found some interesting items in his locker that might shed some light on this. Latex gloves and Vaseline. I think... We just figured out why mm -hmm. those metal detectors were going off so frequently. Oh my goodness. He had deposited Deposit. <laughs> 22 gold pucks, hopefully very gently and hopefully one at a time back there, Danielle. <laughs> oh no. Way back there is what he way, did. Just, just way on back. Just way as a matter, on back. As a matter of fact, in a bizarre <laughs> twist that no one could ever see happening, the Mint had one of their security officers actually recreate the crime. Wait a minute. <laughs> so you're telling me that they made a poor security officer also <laughs> deposit a puck? I'm, I'm kind of curious, Danielle. Like, way do back they there. ask? Yeah, do they ask? Or are they like, okay, look, we hey, need one of you guys. <laughs> I need you to take forward. this puck, grab some <laughs> lube, let's go. <laughs> or did they pick like their worst security guard? <laughs> Harold. Hey, Harold. Yeah, you're sitting at the front door all day not doing anything. Get over here. <laughs> That's so awful. Why would they make someone recreate that? <laughs> they made him recreate the crime and the first archway detector would go off, but the second wand detection would never find it. As if the story couldn't get more insane, Danielle. Oh, no. The judge that Leston had to face when he was prosecuted in November of 2016 was named Judge Duty. You're not to joking. be confused. No, I'm not. It's completely real. And not to be confused with, with my favorite daytime TV judge, Judge Judy. <laughs> he's Judge Duty. Judge Duty. And I'm sort of glad the he's Canadian a judge. The Canadian spinoff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He should. He should have a show. Dun, dun, dun. Welcome to Judge Duty. Eh? Judge Duty. <laughs> Honestly, Danielle, I'm kind of glad he's a judge because otherwise he would just be Mr. Duty. And that's that's just not a cool name. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. Judge Duty is way better. Mr. Duty. Um, but there was a big challenge in this case. The pucks obviously mm -hmm. weren't marked in any way to prove that they were from the mint. And yeah. The Mint had no records about any gold going missing, so this case would turn out to be largely circumstantial, but you can't fool a duty expert no, like Judge not. Duty. The prosecution pointed out that Leston was arranging to build a home in Jamaica and buying a boat in Florida. He wired 35000 to the contractor for his Jamaican home and 34000 to the boat supplier in Florida, and he did all that on $55,000 a year. At the time mm. that, that he got caught. Math ain't mathin'. Mm -mm. Also, an expert analyzed the gold pucks and found that they were the exact same purity as gold from the mint. And the shape was the exact same as the ladle used by the mint for their purity testing. Okay, good. I was hoping there was something that they could do there. Yeah. And that ladle was not sold publicly. It was it was custom for their refinement process. So. Got him. Yeah, basically, you take one of those pucks, it yep. exactly fits. You can tell it came from that ladle. And I'm sure even if there was a simple imp imperfection in the ladle, mm -hmm. like a little dent on one side or something, it would almost be like a fingerprint. You could say, yeah. like, you know, this this definitely came from here. 
Uh, the defense pointed out that Leston could have bought the gold himself, but then they didn't really provide any documentation to support that. They also <laughs> pointed out that they meant, hey, they never tracked that gold went missing in the first place. Leston didn't even take the stand to defend himself. I heard he's uncomfortable sitting on hard surfaces, Daniel. It's oh my gosh, well, wanna... I could imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Judge Duty would tell the courtroom, in my view, there is only one conclusion that can be reached when the totality of the evidence is considered that Leston Lawrence secreted gold pucks out of the mint. Mm -hmm. The evidence from the records of the archway metal detectors is consistent with the defendant having regularly secreted gold in his rectum. So says Judge Duty. Leston was found guilty of robbing 22 gold nuggets worth over $165,000. He was ordered to pay $190,000 in restitution and serve 30 months in prison. Apparently, the court has no way to collect the money that's been wired out of the country. Um, yeah. And he has three years after his prison sentence to pay the money back, or he's going to spend another 30 months in jail, kind of similar to your story. Oh. They're looking for the money. Yeah. And yeah. also similar to your story, that money amount gets lowered at some point. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, through the appeals process, his lawyers were like, hey, you're charging him for how much the gold was at the time he was prosecuted and not Ooh. how much he made. Kind of similarly, though, how much yeah. he made from it. Exactly. So, they were pushing for that and they basically they could was it prove successful? Uh, yeah, they could prove what yeah. he sold it for. So they got it down to 130,000. Now, he uh, made a brief statement to the court during his judgment. I'd just like to say thank you, sir. And that's it. No further comment. You know, Canadians. Canadians eh? Yeah. Known they're they're known for being super polite, Danielle. <laughs> Uh, Judge Duty was aware of the lasting implications that Leston was facing. Quote, Mr. Lawrence has had his name and photograph displayed on the internet and in media around the world. This has undoubtedly given him a greater stigma and affected his reputation more than a conviction normally would have. And it will make it more difficult for him to get employment in the future. Depends on where, I guess. I mean, I could see certain shows in Vegas or Tijuana. <laughs> Go to Vegas, know. you'll be right at home. <laughs> <laughs> the men also wanted to get the word out that their security has been improved. Oh, Quote, that's good. Yeah. The Mint is one of the most secure facilities in Canada, and we are confident that we have the right security measures in place to effectively operate our business. They told the press they've upgraded the facility's security checkpoint and screening process. They've made upgrades to the camera systems, adding high-def surveillance in all areas of the Mint, and they've tightened up the employee screening process with their new hire, Mr. Ben Dover. A thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that last part I, I might have thrown in there as a joke. I enjoy thank it, you. Though. <laughs> thank you, CBC, Ottawa Citizen, Time Magazine, Mint.ca, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. Now, Danielle, I have to ask you. Okay. Do you think he stole more? I mean, he was working there for like think five six years at the point where he was caught my guess is absolutely yes that's kind of what i'm thinking and i we really know think so the metal detector went off more times than pucks they yeah. found so but mm -hmm. uh, yeah i'd be very surprised if this wasn't going on for a while i mean i like i don't know how to feel about it because there's part of me that's like that it shouldn't have been this simple but also, like, he took the time to think out a plan like that. <laughs> so part of me, yeah. I'm so, like, torn. I'm, like, it's kind a, of impressed that he was, like, how can I get through this without them finding it? I think he just recognized that he was in a really good position to yeah. try to pull that off because of it not really being cataloged yet. I mean, exactly. it was after that refinement process, you know, they're probably going to press yep. it into bars and then weigh it and, and catalog it. Mm -hmm. So, um it's interesting, like, who knows how long he had that job, how long he yeah. had that thought and then started acting on it. But he's really not like some super deep criminal, like the way That's that what he I'm was. Saying. Yeah. He, I mean, it, he kind of ran into the same thing that they did, they did with the maple, uh, with the maple syrup. Yeah. Like he went to retail establishments trying to move this stuff instead of, you know, he could have sold it black market, not mm -hmm. got as much per sale, but he was really busted because he was using these legitimate businesses and just one yeah. person thought about it. So, um, yeah. 
Oh my uh, so apparently those wands cannot detect metal in body cavities. Okay, and I was going to ask what what the difference was. Yeah, yeah. So how I mean, wait, but like then how do they consider that to be like uh, how come that is their backup? I don't know. How yeah. do you like downgrade? Like here, let me get <laughs> you a, a point. stronger, you know. I, I mean, if understand. it's detecting something that's on your body, then you'd figure the next step is we want to identify where it is. Exactly. But then there should be a third step. If you go through the yeah. archway, it goes off. The wand can't find it. Then you have to assume this could be something that's in their body. Exactly. And you know, I mean, we know we've done other stories with things being smuggled and stuff like that. I mean, there's there's reasons people would put things mm -hmm. in their body, obviously, yep. just like this story. But yeah, that's just strange to me. I don't know why that would be. Yeah. The only step of further security and checks. Yeah. Um, just one more quick little note. Um, Judge Duty, his first name is actually Peter, but I'm not going anywhere further with that. <laughs> just once again, I'm so glad he's a judge and he needs his own TV show. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm telling you, it needs to be the Canadian spinoff. <laughs> wow. All right. I'm just saying, if it if it were me, I would be voting for your story. Oh. <laughs> that was, no, that was great. It's, I love that he very just different. apologizes. To <laughs> You've got a giant criminal enterprise, uh -huh. and you know I've got one man and a dream, Daniel. Yeah, well, a dream and some latex gloves and Vaseline, and that's oh my gosh, gonna make that dream happen. Home in Jamaica, new boat <laughs> out of Florida. All right. Time to get to some of our extra stories. We always find little tidbits that we bump into. We want to share with you guys. Danielle's going to kick it off. I don't. Right. I don't think this is a crime though. What's What's going on with this one, Danielle? No. Okay. So we all know that with extra stories, I just like throw all rules to the wind, and so this one doesn't actually have any sort of charges. <laughs> okay. I just stumbled across it. I can't not share these things. So there were no charges here, but it's the most hilarious, stereotypical. Canadian thing ever. So in 2013, a video was uploaded to YouTube that captured two Calgary police officers in a drag street race. Police competition. officers? Yes. Mm -hmm. To see who could make it to Tim Hortons first. Oh, so they both, wanted some Timmy's, eh? They did. They did. They wanted some Timmy's. So both police cruisers were stopped at a red light. Clearly this was being filmed on someone's like dash cam. And you can see them like toying with each other in their cruisers. They're like back and forth and back, like who's going to get further in, like creep into the intersection before the light turns green. Yeah. And the second it does, both cruisers peel out. You see them both split and go into two completely different entrances and it pans over and it's freaking Tim Hortons. <laughs> I mean, flew across this intersection, tires squealing. And when this video was found, an investigation was started. Okay. They're like, oh, I know. I mean, you know, I, yes, it could be dangerous. What if someone was on the road? Or, I mean, it, I get yeah. it. I get it. I get it. And but. I mean, that's not really a good look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, they did find that, you know, they're obviously was some questionable behavior but i think their exact thing was that the video didn't appear that they made it to 50 miles per hour oh like okay. that was like the exact statement like they didn't even make it to 50 miles per hour so nothing illegal was technically done like they didn't surpass the speed limit okay they were definitely goofing off yeah Reckless and acceleration was... might Re <laughs> maybe like a little light charge there or something but yeah yeah I but All nothing right. was done. But I mean, two Canadian police officers street racing to a Tim Hortons to get donuts and coffee first. Fantastic. Great way to start off the extra stories. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, I actually have a bit of a trend in my extra stories today. You might not know this, Danielle, but Canadians can be notorious apologizers. Quick note. Yeah. I've always heard that. The one mm -hmm. time I went to Canada, everyone was so rude that I encountered. What? <laughs> Which is why I've never understood that saying. I went one time and I went to Toronto and yeah. I was there for like two weeks because my brother used to live in Toronto. And like majority of the people that I met were incredibly rude. Really? I yeah. have never had that experience. Um, let, me, let me just say, and I, I think 
I can do this. I, I don't think anyone there would mind. On behalf of the entire <laughs> whole of Canada. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I really do think it was just a weird fluke. It must be. It must be. Maybe it was, was it your headspace, Danielle? Was it where it you were at look, emotionally? I hope not. I was only like 13 years old. Mm, okay okay angsty teen <laughs> well you might have heard the old joke how do you get a canadian to apologize step on their foot <laughs> and this story is kind of a perfect example yeah. of that. alberta canada 2016 at the small on away hotel they have a bar and it was karaoke night a man entered intent on committing a crime however a nice lady was on the stage singing a Dixie Chicks song, or just the Chicks now. There's no Dixie in them anymore. Mm. So he waited for her to finish, then pulled out a gun and fired a shot in the ceiling. He demanded that everyone get on the floor. He demanded money, but not from the patrons. He was only robbing the bar. After the employees gave him the cash, he headed for the door, stopped, turned around, and apologized to the room saying, sorry guys. Then he left. He got caught the next day when his car ran out of gas. Unfortunately, the bullet had ricocheted off the ceiling and it hit an employee in the hand. So the man wound up facing 13 charges, including armed robbery, careless use of a firearm and assault causing bodily harm. But he was sorry. I was about to say he may be general. He maybe genuinely was sorry. He probably felt even I, worse I and wanted it. to apologize again after he found out that his bullet hit somebody. I also think it's kind of cool that he didn't want to rob the patrons. Yeah. Like, it just, I don't know. That's just, it's showing he's coming from a different place. Yeah. Now, this final one for me, mm -hmm. I have to pay homage to our very first episode. It's like the first episode of Crime After Crime if we had a Canadian spinoff. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. In November of 2015, in Thunder Bay, Ontario, a man wearing sunglasses and a bucket hat at night, okay, entered a Max store. He came in, was demanding money from the register, and he would leave and come back and leave and come back. And finally, he wanted it known that he meant business because he had a weapon. He had a snow scraper. Like this a man window snow scraper. was wielding a window <laughs> snow scraper, <laughs> demanding money before being arrested for assault with a weapon. You guys, I'm telling you, Canadian version. That's a pretty good one. Snow scraper. I mean, it's got a blade on it. I play yeah. no games with that. That's definitely a weapon. Yeah. It's a weird weapon. If we ever get to producing live events, we're going to have an octagon, like a, a fight. And mm -hmm. one guy's going to be armed with hot dog tongs and the yep. other is snow scraper. I don't yep. know which one I would bet on, honestly. Snow scraper for sure. I mean, and like they, he had it up like it was like a Harry Potter wand like that. <laughs> There's a picture of it. He looks. He yeah, but I can do that with the tong. I can do that with my hot dog tongs. It. That's very true. <laughs> you could like whoosh, and yeah. slice someone with a window scraper. Well, I think we need to end today's episode with some warm fuzzies, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Continuing on on my apology tip from Canada, who they I just heard again. Yes, sorry guys, th they're really sorry about that. <laughs> this story comes from the real town of Dawson Creek, and I don't think it's Dawson's. I think it's Dawson Creek in British okay. Columbia, not the TV show. Mm -hmm. Amaz Bazinet was arrested after a series of break-ins that led to a police chase involving at least four stolen vehicles. That's a lot of apologizing, but we'll get there. That's a whole he, lot of apologizing, yeah. He'd be charged with 37 counts, including assaulting a police officer and destroying at least $5,000 worth of crops in a farmer's field. Amuz wrote a letter to the city of Dawson Creek. This is Amuz Bazinet, the man that ran from the police on July 10th and caused your town problems. I want to make a public apology for my actions that day. I didn't come to your town to cause problems or scare anybody. I'm not a bad person. I just made a bad choice that day. 
I used to live in the peace area for 15 years. I worked in homes and schools, even your museum downtown. I owned my own flooring business, married with three small children in Fort St. John. I played hockey on the church team until my divorce. I took it really bad. I got into drinking, then drugs, then meth just before this happened. I made a very bad choice that day by running from the police. I'm lucky they were professional and didn't take my life. I'm very grateful. Since I have been in jail, I've taken one-on-one -on -one counseling for drugs and alcohol, and I've taken five employment courses. I have a job here in the jail, in the carpentry shop. I've been working with the pastor and making dressers for low-income families. I've taken the time here to think about what I did and get clean so this never happens again. I'm very sorry. Sincerely, Amaz Bassanet. Is that, I mean, it warms me up inside. It is. And I honestly love how like personal it feels. Like Super he's apologizing personal. to a whole town. He's like, by the way, while I've been here. <laughs> but can't you, I, I mean, it. I think it's like great. the association, like he's yeah. just opening up and you're like, I've, yeah. I've, I've felt like Amaz at some point, but yeah. And it's like, you know, you know what? It's all right, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I told I you that. <laughs> Canadians amazing at apologizing, but I do just want to point out they have never apologized for giving us Nickelback. Oh boy. Yeah. Just saying. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. I'm right there with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who is going to win this month? You guys are the ones that get to vote. Who told the best, cr or not crimes or fame? I'm over here repeating last things Canadian crime. Canadian crimes. Hmm. Well, you can vote on the Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops, or you can head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also have a link in the description box down below that you can click, or you can hit the little letter I up in the corner, and that will also take you to vote. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge thank you to all of our patrons. The patrons, oh my gosh, we have such a fun time over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly, all sorts of topics, and patrons also get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Okay, we are going to be back on the 1st of August with a topic you guys have asked for for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've kicked it around a little yep. bit. We think it's finally time to take it on. YouTuber crimes. Crimes conducted by people like yours truly. I am so interested to see. We did like a brief search together to kind of see, test the waters a little bit. Yeah. Yep. I found out something shocking about someone that I had had truly looked up to. <laughs> I think one of us is going to have to do that story, at least yeah. in the extra stories, if not one of the main ones. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. especially because you have such a connection there. Yeah, yeah. like what on earth? It yeah. should be an interesting one. Yep, it's going to be. <laughs> this show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. The best way you can help others find us is to tell them, tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime so much that if they checked your locker, they would find a latex glove <laughs> and some Vaseline. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.